قال مولانا ومقتدانا الإمام جعفر الصادق عليه الصلاة والسلام فأما من كان من الفقهاء سائنا لنفسه حافظا لدينه مخالفا على هواه مطيعا لأمر مولاه فللعوام أن يقلدوه Dear brothers and sisters In this session, I'm going to focus on the necessity of taqlid. Taqlid is one of the contentious issues, one of the controver controversial issues that have been discussed by different scholars. What is the necessity of taqlid? Why do we follow a scholar? There are numerous questions regarding taqlid or regarding the issue of emulation. When it comes to the necessity of taqlid, of course, again, the scholars have different views, have different opinions, whether taqlid in this time of widespread education is necessary or not. However, Shia scholars are of the view that taqlid is necessary even in, in this age, which is the age of information. But scholars from other religious sects have questioned the necessity of taqlid. They have put forth questions and spurious arguments regarding the necessity of taqlid. I'll come to it and I will explain the different views and opinions regarding the necessity of taqlid. But of course there are certain questions which we have to deal regarding the issue, regarding the subject of taqlid. What are the rational and textual evidence for taqlid? Are there any verses in the Holy Quran that support the concept of taqlid? Are there any traditions, any sayings from the infallibles that authenticate and support the concept of taqlid. If there are any, any proofs, any sayings, any verses, what are those proofs? What are those verses and sayings and narrations? In case we prove that taqlid is a must, it is necessary, even in this age of widespread education. How are you going to do the taqlid? What is the procedure of taqlid? Whom are you going to follow? What are the conditions and the 
necessary qualifications or the necessary traits that a scholar, a mujtahid, or a jurist must have. And does taqlid require any formality or not? Now there, of course, there are other questions. I'm going to deal with all of these questions one by one. And of course, if this if in this program and in this session, I'm not going to, if I'm not going, if I'm not able to respond to all the questions, I will reply to some of the important questions and some of the important concerns of the mu'minin and muslimin. Now, coming to the first question, why is taqlid necessary? Taqlid is something rational. If we look at the concept of taqlid, if we look at the normal people, we come to the conclusion that every individual is somehow following someone else. Every one whether he is Muslim or non-Muslim, is, some, is following an expert. The necessity of taqlid is the result of a rational conclusion based on the need for divine guidance. We are in need of divine guidance. We are in need of understanding and comprehending the religion and following the religion in the right way and in the right manner. It is not possible for us to delve into the religion and to into the religious books, to read all the sources, to read and understand the Quran and tradition. And of course, it is not Rational also for all Muslims to engage in understanding jurisprudence. Different people in the community, different people in the society should engage in different activities. Some should study medicine, some should in, in, study biology, some should study physics. Some should study philosophy. Some should study the Quranic sciences. And of course, some of us should engage in studying jurisprudence. It is not possible and practicable for Muslims to study jurisprudence and not to engage in other activities. The Holy Quran says, فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ وَلِيُنْذِرُ قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِ of every community, there should be a section of people, a group of people who should migrate, who should go out and engage in and studying religion. They should specialize in religion. Those, they should learn the religion. And then they should come back, come back to their people. They should get back to their community and warn them. Of course, this ayah, this verse from the Holy Quran has two interpretations. I'm not going to mention those two interpretations, but this is one of the meanings of this verse. That of every people, there should be some people, some individuals who should go out and seek knowledge and then come back and warn their people. 
And of course, this verse of the Holy Quran is also a proof. It's also an evidence substantiating the concept of taqlid. There's also another verse which says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask if you do not know. If you do not know, ask those people who know. Go to them, ask your question, put forth your question, and ask to understand what you do not know. To know what you do not know. This verse, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ This is one of the main verses in the Holy Quran that support the concept of taqlid. The concept of taqlid is not something difficult to understand. It is very easy. What does taqlid mean? Taqlid literally means imitation. But imitation has got a positive meaning as well as a negative meaning. When it comes to the negative meaning of taqlid, it means blind imitation, blindly following something, just as the Jews were following their leaders. If there are some narrations from the infallible Imams and also from the Prophet, peace be upon him, condemning and reprehending those people who are following, those narrations refer to blind imitation. They have nothing to do with the emulation, with following of a learned person by an ignorant person. The concept of taqlid and of course, I will mention also some of the narrations, some of the very clear and very explicit narrations concerning taqlid, concerning the subject of taqlid, inshallah. <laughs>
and eligible for taqlid. Of course, the narration refers that if there is a jurist who controls his nafs, who protects his religion, who suppresses his evil desires, and who obeys his master, then he is qualified for taqlid. He is eligible for taqlid. But if there is someone who is not obedient to the, com to the command of his master, who is not actually in control of his nafs, who does not suppress his desires, his passions, and who is whimsical, he is not qualified for taqlid. We cannot follow him. Because he might give a, a verdict which is not in accordance with the religion. He might give a fatwa which is not in line with the teachings of the Holy Quran, the teachings of the Holy Prophet and the infallible Imams. He must be a pious and a God-fearing person. Another narration concerning the concept of taqlid is from the last Imam, the last Hujjah, and the last divine authority, Imam Mahdi, may Allah hasten his re reappearance. When asked, about the new events, the new occurrences. He said, the Imam said, وَأَمَّا الْحَوَادِثُ الْوَاقِعَ فَرْجَعُوا فِيهَا إِلَى رَوَاتِ حَدِيثِنَا فَإِنَّهُمْ حُجَّةِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَأَنَا حُجَّةُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِمْ if there is a new matter in the society, a new phenomenon, a new occurrence, then فيها, return hadithana, to the narrators of our traditions. Go to those who narrate from us. Because they are in authority on you, on our behalf. And we are on authority, an authority on them. We are hujja on them. We are a proof, a proof over them. And of course, there are numerous other traditions concerning the concept of taqlid. We follow a mujtahid because we believe that he is an expert and the field of religion. He is a knowledgeable person, he is a learned man, and the field of religion. It is of course very rational for every individual who does not have knowledge of something to refer to someone who has knowledge of that thing. I can give you a very example, probably you, you have heard this example. Many a times, but it's good to remind you of this example. Why do we go to a doctor when we feel sick? When we feel ill, we go to a doctor because we believe he is an expert in the field of medicine. Because he is a specialist. He is someone who can diagnose our problem, our disease, and the cause of the disease. He can prescribe you the medicine required for treating and for recovering from the disease. He is the person who can help you recover. He is the person who can give you proper advice. 
He is the person who can guide you. We trust him because he is a specialist. We trust him because he studied in that field. We cannot ask him why you have given this and that medicine. It is irrational to ask him why you have prescribed such and such medicine. And of course, it is always irrational to ask a doctor as to why you have prescribed me a certain type of medicine. The same is true with the jurisprudent. A jurisprudent gives the advice needed. He gives the instruction required. He, en he engages and specializes in the field of jurisprudence and extracts the command, the divine command, the religious instruction from the Quran and from the tradition and then when he comes to a conclusion about something, then he gives it to you in the form of an injunction and in the form of a verdict. We should trust the jurisprudent because he is the only expert in the field of religion. He is the only expert in the field of jurisprudence. He is the only person who can deduce and infer Islamic laws from the authoritative sources such as the Quran and tradition. It is not, of course, always rational to ask why a mujtahid has given a certain fatwa, it's not always possible to understand the rational, the philosophy, and the concept behind a fatwa. As a, as a follower, as someone who believes in the authenticity and correctness of the fatwa of a mujtahid, we should not expect a mujtahid to give the reason, to explain the rationale, the, the philosophy, and the reason behind a fatwa. In the same way that we cannot ask a doctor, we cannot ask a jurisprudent about the reason and the philosophy or the purpose behind a certain verdict. Of course, it is necessary for every individual for every person to refer to the one who is the most knowledgeable, the most experienced, the most skillful person. It does not make any difference whether he is a doctor, whether he is a builder, whether he is an architect, whether he is an engineer, whether he is a jurist, or whether he is a biographer. It does not make any difference. The more knowledgeable a person, the more knowledgeable an expert, the less he is likely to make any mistakes. If, if there is a surgeon, if there are two surgeons, let's say, let's assume, if there are two surgeons, and we believe that one of the surgeons is more experienced and more ex skillful, it's always advisable to refer to the one who is more skillful. You cannot submit yourself to someone, to a surgeon who has no experience. He might have studied something, he might have gained some knowledge about surgery, but you always refer to the one who has gained enough experience and of whose view and whose action and whose advice and whose work you are confident. The same is true with the jurist. You should always follow a jurist who is the most experienced, the most qualified, the most learned, the most knowledgeable person. 
because if a jurist is less knowledgeable, if he is less learned, then it is very much likely that he might commit mistakes in his fatwa. He might commit errors. He might give you an, an, a piece of advice which might be wrong in reality. That's why the more learned a jurisprudent is, the more experienced a jurisprudent, a jurisprudent, a marja, a mujtahid is, the more likely it is that his fatwa might be correct. His fatwa is more likely to be correct, to be authentic. It's a reality, a reality in everybody's life. That, that every ignorant person refers to a person who is knowledgeable. Even a mujtahid in his daily life refers to a person who is expert. Where do you think a mujtahid goes when he feels ill, illness? Where does he, to whom does he turn? when he has, let's say, a, a physical problem, or let's say, when he, when he is ill, he turns to a doctor. To whom does a mujtahe turn when he wants to build a house, when he wants to build a school, a religious school? Of course, he refers to a builder, to an architect, to a mason and to an engineer. A jurisprudent is not an expert in all field. He is an expert in the field of jurisprudence. He is an expert in the field of religion and the field of biography. He is not necessarily, necessarily a philosopher. He is not necessarily a, a, a mystic. He is not necessarily someone who is in divine communication. He is in communication with God. Some people believe, wrongly believe, that if someone is a mujtahid, he has knowledge of the absence, he has knowledge of ghaib, he has knowledge of the occultation, and he has knowledge of everything on earth. No, a mujtahid is not necessarily a person who knows everything about the religion, about God, about the unseen. He is the, the concept of experience, the concept of skillfulness, and the concept of learnedness is something relative. It is something that has degrees, that has, that has gradation. Different scholars, different mujtahid are there in the Islamic seminaries, but they are, not all, they are not in the same footing. They are not in the same level of knowledge and experience and, and eligibility. Some of them are more non-learned, some of them are less learned. Some of them are more educated, some of them are less educated. We are bound to follow the one who is more educated and who is more learned. As I said, the more learned a person is, the more learned a jurist is, the less likely, he, the less he is likely to commit any errors when he gives a fatwa. I will speak Inshallah, in the next session to come, I'll speak about the qualities, the qualifications, the conditions of a qualified mujtahid. I will also address some of the questions which you might have in your mind. For example, you might say, okay, how can we find, how can we identify the most learned mujtahid? How can we come to know that a certain mujtahid has such and such qualities and a, cert and a certain mujtahid does not have that. 
I will explain the criteria, the conditions, and the guidelines that have been put forth by our scholars and by our infallible Imams. Insha'Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh